I promise I'll get off the stage after this panel and you can hear someone else. Um, <laughs> so, um, welcome, to, uh, welcome to our lovely expert panel. Uh, we have uh, CL, um, who we've all met, um, from Open Culture Foundation. We have Luke Bacon on the end from Open Australia Foundation. Uh, we have Gemma Mulder from My Society. Um, we have Ifema Onyibuchi from the Public and Private Development Center in Nigeria. And we have Michael Canares from the World Wide Web Foundation in Indonesia. So thank you all for coming. Um, right, we're gonna kick us straight into uh, the questions. Um, this panel is basically about examples of civic technologies and their impact. So pretty much like a nice segue from what I was just talking about. Um, I'll give everyone five minutes to say hello, to, uh, to introduce themselves, and maybe say one or two things about your interests. Um, and then we'll kick straight into questions. So, uh, Gemma, should we start with you? I was going to say, don't start with me, because we've heard a lot from my society. But um, thanks, Beck, for the intro. Um, I don't need to introduce my society, because Beck already did that. Um, but like Beck said, we're kind of trying to concentrate more on you know, less on usage numbers of our sites, because we know, you know, millions of people use our websites in the UK. Um, for example, last year, what do they know? Our Freedom of Information platform in the UK had 6.5 million users. So we know there's a lot of people using it, but do we know the impact on these people of using it? You know, so over the last couple of years since Beck and her team have been, well, her team of one, <laughs> one or two people um, have been doing the research agenda at my society. We know a lot more about those users. Um, so for example, on Write to Them, uh, which is a platform in the UK that allows people to write to their representatives, we know that 40% of those hadn't never written to a representative before, that sort of thing. Um, but we've also been looking at um, impacts on uh, governments um, of some of our tools. And in part of my work, because I work on the Freedom of Information team, I've been trying to get more stories of impact um, out there, um, looking at, you know, people are getting information, but what for? Um, so um, I guess for us, it's more about usage numbers, it's more about actual impact, but it's also about sharing methodologies of how to go about sort of survey research and impact research. So that's why we host Tic Tech, um, and we hope people have learned from each other at previous Tic Techs and at this one. Um, but yeah, for me, the emphasis is sharing methodologies on research. How do we do that more? Um, I'm Michael Canares. I work at World Wide Web Foundation's Open Data Lab in Jakarta. Um, and we know for a fact that in civic technology, the world is not flat and power imbalance is real. So for us at the World Wide Web Foundation's Open Data Lab in Jakarta, we are experimenting on ways at which we'll be able to use the power of open data to make sure that we can achieve economic, social, and political impacts. Our work is largely in the national space, so we experiment on ways on how, for example, we can encourage governments to become convinced that openness is important and opening data sets would actually uh, redound to economic, political, and social benefits for its people. At the same time, we also make sure that uh, that open data that has been put out there is not wasted, and that intermediaries like civic so civil society organizations, media groups, students, uh, IT students at both university and high school levels are actually able to use that data. Because for what use is that data out there when nobody is actually using it? And then governments will just be at the mode of actually saying that they're being transparent, uh, they are being open, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, all of these things that are being put out publicly are not actually used uh, for, for, for benefit. Um, a lot of our work is at the subnational space, as I've mentioned. So we assisted, for example, uh, teachers' organizations to access data, analyze government budgets, and how they can advocate for better education spending. We looked at health organizations working at, uh, HIV, on HIV and AIDS, uh, and see how, for example, you can use data, uh, uh, how you can protect data, because HIV and AIDS, for example, in the context of Indonesia is a, uh, is a very sensitive issue. At the same time, promote awareness on what are the better treatments available, what are the, cent what are the help centers that they can go to, and so on and so forth. 
So we work both with governments, civil society, organizations, media, intermediaries, and even at the level of academia to make sure that we can, uh, we can harness the power of open data to achieve real outcomes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ifoma Jareth Nyambuchi. I work for a civil society organization called Public and Private Development Center. We are into public procurement monitoring, and over the years, we have used the Freedom of Information Act, which was enacted in Nigeria in 2011, to request for public finance expenditure from the government. And over the years, we've been working with other civil society organizations like CORD, MRA, ANAGE, a lot of them, and we've been leveraging on technology to make our government more responsive and also cater for the needs of the people. And for us, civil, civic tech has come to impact our government and our society. And we are leveraging on the OGP, which Nigeria just recently signed on to, to also work in collaboration with private partnerships, developing platforms. Currently, Nigeria, after our membership as OGP member, developed the Nigerian Open Contracting Portal, where civil societies and the government and organized private sector are working in collaboration to open up the system, to have an open contracting platform that can capture the public procurement cycle from its budget to its implementation. Because for us in Nigeria, public procurement is the key because that's the channel that the government uses to acquire goods and also disposes those goods, works and services for its citizens. But over the years, we've had that, you know, the opacity of public institutions, even over time requesting for information, you have to make requests using the Freedom of Information Act. And it takes a long time. And when this information comes, they come in different formats. You can't even make sense of them because they come with different codes. And this code doesn't follow those project lines from its inception to its um, implementation. So with the tool that we developed, which I'm going to also talk about tomorrow, Bodeishi, which means open it in Ausa, we've been able to work and also develop the open contracting portal for the citizens. Because for us, this is the key. If we can get our procurement, you know, procurement um, processes right, I think we've gotten everything right because that is where, of course, all of you know when uh, the former Prime Minister of Britain said that Nigeria is fantastically corrupt, okay? So we are working together with the government and we also want to do this in collaboration because no government can uh, survive without its citizens. And we are civil societies, we cannot take the place of our government, we have a government. So all we can do is to develop these tech tools and also work in collaboration to make sure that the government uses this tech group tech tools for the for public use and also use that to also improve the welfare of its citizens. Thank you. Hello again everyone. Um, so I introduced uh, the, the OCF, uh, the Open Culture Foundation, briefly earlier. So I will focus a bit more about the GovZero community here in, uh, in Taiwan and how I see um, two types of different impacts that um, the community is making. Um, so first of all, the community is organized in a very, um, well, unorganized way. Um, so there are thousands of contributors, and then we have a um, bi-monthly hackathon for the past uh, five months, oh, sorry, five years. And so if you're staying over uh, the next week, uh, I, I would like to also invite you to come to the hackathon on Saturday. Uh, it will be a, in a different venue. And uh, so um, projects in the GovZero community uh, were started more organically rather than uh, with, with a grand plan of we should be focusing on X or Y or Z. But we are also experimenting uh, some more uh, focused way that having a grant that is um, inspired by um, the Knight grant and also the, the prototype fund in, in Germany. And so we're experimenting that. And then tonight in the Google party, you will be seeing the uh, results from the first round of the fundies, uh, the, the grantees. Um, so, so um, some of the projects I, I think that interestingly uh, ch changing the way impacts are seen. It's like I want to, um, um, there was a, uh, a labor code reform uh, controversy uh, um, earlier this year or the end of last year. Uh, so you and from the uh, GovZero community created a tool called the, the labor code calculator. So 
Uh, why was the labor code uh, reform a controversy? Because there are different versions being proposed, and then everyone is arguing like in different aspects of how the labor code should be. Um, with this calculator, you put in um, uh, the average number you work every work week, uh, work day in the week, like Monday for eight hours and Tuesday eight hours, etc. And it will show you in different versions of the legislation how it will impact you and how it will be uh, meaningful to you, or maybe the employer cannot uh, treat you like this way. It will be illegal in this particular version. Um, so, so this this is an interesting new way that uh, policy making is being brought more closer to um, to the people that the policy affects. And um, where I see this impact is is that the t the tool was actually forked and then used by the Ministry of Labor to advocate their version. And so now you see the code reuse from the community to the government. And 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 hopefully I, I think this will change that uh, policymaker that's. Um, in the future to see, oh, this is a great way that we can actually connect people with the policy they're making. So rather than um, after the policy was made and then people start uh, going nuts, we can do it earlier and then let people see how these impacts are. Um, well, but sadly, it was the uh, one, one of the controversial uh, um, version being passed and so they're now revisiting the, the legislation again. Um, so I wouldn't say that impact was there yet, but hopefully in the future. Um, another aspect of impact I, I've seen in this um, a grassroots civic tech community is the way that it's organized, provide an agile, agile uh, resilience in, in, um, in some, um, well, maybe it's a protest and then we need a, a better way to have in information being shared, or it is uh, in a disaster that was, uh, there was a, a, a dust explosion um, a few years ago, and then there's, there, it's a new way, uh, it's a new kind of disaster that uh, the, uh, the country has never faced. So the, uh, the tech community provide um, what was needed but not there, is an inquiry system to where your friends and family are, uh, if they're being like, sent to which hospital. Um, so um, having this kind of grassroots uh, uh, technolog technologist and the community that's willing to work on civic tech uh, in general, I think it's a, it's a great impact to um, uh, where things happen that's unexpected. Um, I slightly missed the memo that, um, that we weren't doing slides, um, so I'm just going to show you some slides quickly um, of one of our projects, um, and MG is just going to help me switch it over. Um, but would you just hold that for a second? I was, I was told we're not using slides because if we're too tall, then the projector will be like, projecting on our face. But yes. luckily, we're not too tall. <laughs> That's uh, my desktop background. That's my dad. <laughs> uh, I, let's just go. Um, well, you can see we've got a similar haircut happening. Um, so this is just gonna be five minutes quickly. Um, my name's Luke Bacon, I'm from the Open Australia Foundation. Um, I build and design civic tech in Australia. We have five projects. This is kind of us. Um, we have uh, two full-time staff and then a lot of volunteer developers who kind of help us make all this possible. And I just wanted to, because I'm not very good at kind of describing it without showing you, I wanted to show you an example of one of our projects that is a bit un of an unusual project. And um, the impact, you know, we think it's having um, but then also some of the challenges around that um, where we're, we're not sure, um, you know, is, is this actually helping people? Um, when we talk about impact, we really talk about people affecting the change they want. Open Australia Foundation is not making an impact. It's not changing society. It's not changing our democracy. The people who use those tools to create the change that they want to make, they're the people creating an impact. Um, and we really focus on that. So this is one of our project's planning alerts. In Australia, as in lots of parts of the world, we have a planning system where if you want to, um, if you want to build a new building or if you want to you know, change a park or the way a street works or anything like that, you need to get a development approval um, from the local council. And that local council is meant to represent the people in that local area to make sure those developments suit the people who live there. It's, it's meant to be like, at its best, human-centered design around local planning. But it doesn't really work very well or like that. Um, so we have this project where you can put in an address, like 132 Belmore Road, um, and then sign up 
to receive email notifications whenever there are these development applications for your area. Because otherwise, um, they're sent out by mail. Lots of people don't get them. In lots of parts of Australia, um, the government doesn't have to notify people of lots of, type of, of lots of types of development. So a lot of people are just finding out about development through planning alerts. Um, and this is what the emails look like. You kind of you find out about, uh, yeah, these DAs. Um, and this is what people talk about, um, the people who use planning alerts. Um, so this is an example of someone who found out about a DA, and then they used that early notice to organize to actually challenge it um, and successfully got it changed. Um, this is somebody who is uh, renting, a, um, rent, you know, renting the place that they live in, and they'd been moved out a number of times because um, uh, the owners wanted to subdivide or they wanted to do renovations or stuff like that. And Australia has very, very weak um, renters' rights, so, um, so they can get kicked out at very short notice. But with planning alerts, they're finding out a lot earlier, um, so it's quite important for those people. To give you an idea of the scale, this is our little um, Slack bot that tells us about how planning alerts is going. Um, planning alerts has been running for seven years. Um, 53,000 people use it. Uh, or are signed up to receive alerts, and about a million people a year um, uh, visit the site. Um, so in terms of impact and scale, like for us that in Australia, country of 22 million people, that's really a big scale. Um, and I think that's, you know, it is an achievement of civic tech, that kind of scale. Um, very quickly, people can also comment on DAs. So this is somebody giving feedback. So not only are they getting notified, and that's an important thing, but they can actually give feedback and participate in the project. They can actually write to their local councillors, and local councillors can write back. And this is an example of somebody complaining about the koalas um, uh, getting removed, and this councillor comes back with like, g'day. Um, I thought it was a very funny Australian example to show you. I'm just going to talk very quickly about this other example um, of where a community that already exists and already has a strong network um, gets together and uses a civic tech tool. So in this case, it's the LGBTIQ community in Sydney who are really vibrant and fantastic, powerful community. And this is this fantastic pub called the, um, the Bearded Tit, um, or the Bearded Titan, uh, which is actually just near where I work. So they had a development application to, ex um, to extend the hours of their trading so they could be open till midnight, which is um, quite a controversial thing in Sydney. And the way this community organized using this tool, because suddenly they got this early notice about it, and then they were able to comment very easily and participate, there was 340 um, comments on this application submissions, which is a huge number in Australia. And these are some of the comments. Um, people talking about it from their, their um, personal perspective. When people are talking about what they want their local area to be like, their local democracy, it's a very personal thing. Um, so I think these are really fantastic comments. Um, this is somebody talking about the importance of the um, space for um, local artists. Um, this is somebody who's a shift worker, and they're describing their personal experience to go into these decisions. Um, and this is, a, I think, a really important example. Um, uh, somebody talks about not being safe um, or not feeling safe in a lot of parts of the community, and this space, this pub, is really important to them. So they're trying to participate in this local decision making. Um, and I'll just be one more uh, minute. Um, so what happened? Did these people make an impact? This is a huge number of comments on a submission. You know, in civic tech, we're like, yay, that's really great. But, but you know, did they actually get the space? Um, and this is what they got back from council. So everyone got this letter saying it's been partly approved. And people thought, OK, that's really good. But if you actually dig into it, what the, the approval actually says is we approve this. Um, if about $100,000 worth of renovations are done on the, on the building. Um, so that's a very different thing to saying, yes, we support this, we support this place that there's this huge outpouring of love for. And in, if talking about you know, the impact of all these submissions on this decision, um, this is basically what they said. So as a result of, of our notification, there were 340 submissions. And that's the only mention of those comments in this whole long report. Um, there were four negative uh, submissions that got you know, really detailed response. There's absolutely no evidence that the comments that people made through our system made any impact on the decision of this DA. And potentially, it would have worked a lot better for them if it hadn't have been so controversial. Um, I spoke to the, um, I had some emails with the person who made that decision, and they. Uh, 
So basically the way their system works is that if, if we approve it, even if it's partly approved and in fact we're making it very difficult for this business to do what all these people in the local area want them to do, um, if we came down with the same decision, we're not going to provide any reference or, or give any feedback or note what, what any of those people said. So this is an example where we've got, we've got people notified of the information, they're using that information, we've made it easy to participate. But then when it comes to the response from local government, maybe they're responding in the sense of sending them a letter, but they're not actually responsive to any of the really interesting issues or, or emotional outpouring that these people gave. And we really worry about, in terms of making civic tech, how does that impact these people? You know, these, these 340 people, does that, like, just to be led to this dead end and then told, sorry, computer says no, uh, you know, this really bureaucratic response. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of, of the next steps, maybe we can talk about that later. But, um, but yeah, this is for us a huge issue with, with impact. So that's, that's all. Sorry, that was so long. Everyone, um, really interesting intros there and um, some, some small examples of civic tech. Um, it was really interesting, I thought what Luke was saying there, it's like, yes, we maybe as technologists can make an impact on enabling people to participate and come together, but actually, you know, so far you should come in no further. Um, so there's a really interesting uh, sort of idea there that actually we could be having an impact, but actually because of what happens after our impact, um, that will then Im impact um, how people use these tools in future and whether they actually feel they're of value. Um, so to pass it back to, uh, back to the panel, um, I'm really interested to know what your ideas are about tracking impact you know how do, how do you obviously we want to see impact how maybe you could give us an example um, or an idea of, of how actually you want to do that how you see that happening uh, should we start at the end again <laughs> um, so I mean just to give some examples of what we've done at my society I guess how we've tracked impact um, we've done a lot of user surveys um, which you know give really good data, but only when there's quite a lot of usage of sites anyway. Um, because we, we have tried to do impact surveys on some sites and they haven't got the user base. Y yeah, so only about five users got back, which obviously isn't a very good um, sample of people. Um, so, you know, asking them questions like, you know, is this the first time you've um, contacted a representative? Um, other things like, do you trust that using this site is going to um, make your politicians more accountable? Um, so a variety of different questions like that. Um, the other way that we've been tracking impact are sort of user stories. Um, so uh, like Luke, we've kind of been looking at, obviously the, the users are the ones that make the changes. Um, so we've been kind of tracking some of these um, cases. So for example, on Alavatelli's, we've looked at some of the uh, responses that are getting the most traffic um, and saying, oh, why, why was that getting so much traffic and why was that important? And then talking to the local partners that run, run the sites there um, and getting the story behind things. So, for example, um, the Freedom of Information site in Ukraine, um, they were getting a lot of um, traffic to one particular request and it was the opening times of um, museums in Kiev, um, the times when they were open for free. Um, and this was like the first time they, they were free to residents on certain days of the week. Um, and this was the first time that information had been released. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it got a lot of traffic. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's tracking those sort of individual stories as well as, you know, doing sort of more wide-scale user surveys of um, the user bases. Um, yeah, so that's, that's some of the stuff that we've done at My Society to track impact. So in the case of the lab, we have a fairly sophisticated results measurement framework uh, that we made sometime in 20, 2013 or so. Um, we made it not because the donor required it, but because we wanted to see, uh, since the time that we were established in Indonesia, whether or not we're actually affecting the kinds of change that we would like to see. 
So in that results measurement framework, of course, for those of you who are working in the development aid sector for quite a while uh, now, you will see that there are inputs and outputs and outcomes, and then finally you have impact at that layer. So um, uh, we actually wanted to pursue two strands of outcomes, and one, is, one of that is to ensure that civil society organizations are actually opening up Sorry, using the data sets that, are, that government is actually disclosing. Uh, the other side, we would like to see more governments actually opening up data sets. So uh, tracking that, you have a set of indicators. For example, on the level of governments, you would like to see how many data sets are there. Not only the data sets, but the quality of the data set and the kind of data set that uh, civil society is actually asking for. Because if you have data sets disclosed there, but they're not actually the ones that people have wanted, then there's no use for that. At the same time, we're also tracking the number of organizations that are actually using the data set and achieving something. So I have to be honest with you that at this level of, uh, at this time of the year uh, in our existence, we are still at the level of outcomes. By that, I mean changes in practices, changes in policies within government, changes in capacities of civil society organizations. So just an example, um, this is what, one thing I presented in one of the sessions at Big Tech in Florence this year. So we, we actually uh, we assisted civil society organizations in the, pro in the city of Banda Aceh uh, in Indonesia to use data. We use what we refer to as a responsive open data model, wherein we actually ask civil society organizations what are the types of data they'd like government to disclose before we went to government and say, hey, these are the things that we would like you to disclose because civil society needs it. And after they disclose it, then we went back to them and said, okay, we have to teach you or we have to help each other in making sense out of, of this data. Uh, in that process, we're able to actually train more than seven civil society organizations. So that's a count in our measurement metrics. And more than uh, 56, 000, sorry, 56 people, 40% uh, of that is women and 60% is men. Um, but that's only at the level of activities and output side. But then later on, we track stories on what really happened to these civil society organizations. Our main partner, for example, Girak Ache, who's working on anti-corruption in the mining sector, uh, went to the provincial government. We were working in the city government, and now they're working in the provincial government, and they demanded for the disclosure of mining data. And to cut the long story short, they were able to actually convince uh, the, the provincial government of Aceh to extend the mining moratorium because a lot of the companies that are working in the mining sector in Aceh are actually not clean and clear based on laws and are not actually paying, uh, paying the right amount of taxes and dues to the government. So they were saying using the data the government holds and publishes, they use it saying, hey, you cannot go ahead and push for mining issuance, mining concession issuance, unless you reform mining governance. And I think uh, engaging with your partners over time is actually looking at what outcomes are happening and also potentially what impacts are there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ifema. Thank you. For us in Nigeria, PPDC specifically, we hold more of town hall meetings. Reason is because 90% of contracts are domesticated at the state and local government level. Whereas at the federal level, you have them awarded. But really where they're implemented are the grassroots level. And there's limited access to information. We also have this issue of our Freedom of Information Act not domesticated at the state level. So for us, with the information that we have, we track the project down to the grassroots level. And it was during the last uh, town hall we held in over six states that we got to know that procurement data are not even accessible to those people at the grassroots level. As a matter of fact, those people there heard about contract information for the first time. And this contract, this project, are the ones that we published on our platform, the Budachi Budeshi platform, which you can also check it out, www.budeshi.ng, which houses all the project that was awarded each fiscal year. So when we met them, they told us that the, that our meeting, during our meeting, was the first time they heard about this information. 
And for us, we take this, we collect this information, which one of the recurring uh, decimal from all town halls we, we had was no access to information. And with information that we got from them, we were able to proceed to the federal level and then keep advocating for sectoral reforms because we want them to contextualize our findings and then use it to keep advocating for the um, establishment of the open contracting portal platform. Even though it's not yet, it, we are still in the process of um, having the Bureau of Public Procurement, that's the regulators of procurement in Nigeria to fully implement this and also mainstream it across the uh, entire uh, private public sector. We are advocating for this because we don't want a situation whereby it got you know, stuck or have things done haphazardly, just like the experiences we've had in the past. So we want to make sure that we keep interacting with those at the grassroots level and then make them to have that consciousness, to be the one to be championing for this. Because for us, civil society organization, assessing data is not a problem for us. And also using this problem, but we don't want a situation where we have this platform and it's still the same civil society organizations that are still making use of this platform. So we want a situation where people, our entire uh, community and our citizens understand and knows the linkage between access to information and how it impacts their daily lives and how it impacts their standards of living. So with the information and the feedback we get from them over time, we were able to continue advocating for sectoral reforms and of course for the full implementation of the open contracting data standard. And again, another thing we do is um, we rank public institutions annually and this year's own is coming up on the 28th of this month. That was the International Right to Know Day. So we rank all public institutions based on their level of compliance with the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Over the years, like from January, we keep collecting this information, but they keep asking us, why, what do you do with this information? You've been collecting it. And we are trying to make sure that data is being liberated because without data, you can't make sense of anything. Without data, you can't effectively track how public funds are being disposed and also how these resources are being implemented for public goods. So in ranking them, we showcase to the entire nation who and who discloses information and who hurts information. It's just like name and shame and also putting some kind of peer pressure on them. You see public institutions like the Bureau of Public Service Procurement, it was through our advocacy and annual rankings that they got to start having a proactive disclosure platform. As a matter of fact, they were the only ones that had this last year. And when we gave them a word, other institutions started following suit. And this year we have over five public institutions who, who we are going to unveil their platform because now they have proactive disclosure. And um, in a nutshell, this is to improve access to information so that citizens can be engaged uh, through the entire procurement uh, uh, processes. Well, impact hard to measure and uh, hard to track. And so while uh, people have uh, suggested a few things that do, I want to uh, talk about how um, the st structural change, the structural impact we have in our, our projects, like the, the calculator, uh, labor code calculator I mentioned that, that uh, changed the way that government um, want to advocate its policy. Uh, similarly, the budget visualization tool I built as a first project in Gov Zero uh, about five years ago was used by a uh, city government of Taipei uh, to disclose its official budget. Um, so it's like the government now use latest technology from the community being built because it's open source. And so uh, once one city government start doing that, the other cities start copying it. And uh, um, and uh, as I heard, it's one of the, um, the, the highest uh, um, read uh, official story in, in the Taipei city government's history. Um, so, um, apart from that, um, well, impacts hard, right? <laughs> um, but w what we can also see is that is the project making structural change to um, to the way that uh, the data was released. Um, for a lot of the civic tech project, you started with scraping data, right? After you do that, people got um, interested in your project. People focus on the data. Um, are, are we successfully making the government uh, release the actual data, like not having to scrap it again. Um, we, we have a good example here, but I guess that's one of the hundred bad examples, <laughs> um, is that the, the election commission in, in Taiwan uh, 
was first very relevant to release data that's to um, for you to uh, either visualize or or do uh, analysis on election results um, but at, at some point they figured out oh um, we don't have to build like really bad websites we can just release the data right because this is what they're good at and then um, they're stuck so they started with the election results data, which is uh, spreadsheet converted to um, uh, CSV, which is good. And then they, they, they push it fur further to, um, to the official uh, election platform uh, that is registered by candidates. So uh, usually we get a big piece of paper about three days before the election and telling people uh, this is what all these candidates are saying and they're, they're going to do. Um, but in the past election, 2016, um, the election commission actually released the candidates' basic information uh, and also uh, their official plan form in a JSON data format. Wow. Um, and that, that was after quite a lot of conversation with the community uh, that started building a project uh, that combines all the candidates' past, past uh, behavior in Congress and their asset disclosure and their uh, actual votes in Congress. Um, so. So I think that's also one way we can see it. Is 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 the project uh, making the data source more um, like recognizing the, the 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 right way to do data, and then and then the, um, collaborate better with the uh, civic tech project. Um, yeah. How, so how do we track impact? I think um, uh, Michael and that was that idea of outputs and outcomes is really important. For us, it's about the change that people want. So people don't care about having notice of development applications. They don't actually care about whether they can participate and and um, have their say. Those things actually, you know, they're really important and um, and I think there are real benefits to them. But those people who made all that comments on that um, development application for that um, pub, they want a safe space to be in between the hours of 11 and 12, you know, and, and they want to be there with their friends. The, you know, the other person, um, they're worried about shelter, to, you know, a place to live in that they feel safe in. Um, those are the outcomes that I think are really important and that we're interested in. And they're, as the CEO was saying, you know, really difficult to track. Like, how do, we, how do we track that when it takes so much time um, and, uh, and energy and calling people and emailing and waiting for them to email you back to find out about that story, about that, you know, that pub? Um, and I haven't even gotten to the bottom of it. I need to go much deeper and really um, start building that relationship with them. Um, I, so I think in terms of tracking impact, for, for me, as a developer building these tools, it's about um, me actually talking with people, um, having conversations, building relationships. Um, the added benefits of that are that that really aligns with, you know, user-centered design and user research concepts about you know, developers having these relationships with people. Isn't that strange that these things line up? Um, and also really benefits the tools because you know, we have really hard evidence that the more we talk to people and say, hey, can you tell us a little bit more about how you're using you know, FOI in your work or this tool, suddenly they start using the tool a lot more and, and start thinking about it in more ways and start telling more people about it. Um, that's really exciting. Um, and then, so that's really, so I, I really think qualitative, you know, dart or information is where, is the important information. That said, um, the quantitative information for us is really important as well. Um, and, um, and that's about um, sparking a, a conversation or some research to go and do and lead to that qualitative information. So we've been building, um, taking a little bit of time over the last couple of years. And we only really started doing this kind of research, you know, in the last two years, which is seven years into our organization. Um, so we've started building tools to, to give us information about the outputs, so how many people are commenting, how many people are signed up to the tool, who are the new users who are using it a lot, all that kind of things. Um, and we're um, sending them to our Slack channel so the developers and volunteers as they're working can see that information. Um, and then the idea is that you might see there's this new person who's using planning alerts a lot. Um, and then you might try and get in contact with that person and then you know, follow on from there and, and learn about the impact they're having. So that, that's kind of how we're approaching it, which is a bit of a kind of strange, maybe hacker approach, <laughs> but anyway. I love it, I can make 
think that's great. Um, and really good points about user research as well. Eh? You know, not just build a tool and then figure out if it works, but actually do some of the research beforehand so that you haven't built something that's completely irrelevant. <laughs> I think a lot of us have been there. <laughs> Um, great, okay, just one more question for me and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the floor because I'm sure you guys have questions as well. Um, just wondering about negative or neutral impacts, if, if you guys have come across tools or civic tech that you, know, you thought would have one kind of impact but turned out having something else, whether it was negative, whether it was unexpected maybe, or actually whether you thought, man, this is going to change the world and like literally nothing happened. Um, so, um, instead of the creeping death again, uh, Aoife, how, how about we start with you? So, um, for us, I, I think the tool has come to stay. It's an open contracting portal tool because that's the problem we are having. And we saw a situation whereby everybody has, the interest is there. The commitment from the citizens and from the government is there. But our issue is the issue of, um, Government probably having some kind of distrust because just like I said before, we are civil society organization and we can't take the role of government. So most times when some of these initiatives that we all should come from government to reform the system come from civil society organizations, it kind of uh, you know brings that kind of distrust and also the issue of also collaboration and also making sure that you know that there's coordination that there's harmonization on how everyone does that. Because for us, for us is to achieve an open contracting portal for Nigeria. But then you have also issues of people doing similar things. And those databases doesn't you know, speak to themselves. There's no interoperability of data. And that kind of scares people away because if an institution, for example, is adopting the open contracting data standard, what, what guarantee are you giving them that you won't come back again when the government has it running, that the one that is running now wouldn't be a waste of time for them? So it's also the issue of capacity building to make them also understand the, uh, the necessity, the importance of this, and also how it also works. And again, for the citizens, uh, one problem is trying to get the government to do the right thing, and then also having the citizens to also make use of all these tools. We have available tools, but also how people use this, and also how they understand you know, the, how these uh, platforms and how these initiatives affect their daily life. Uh, a lay person or an average Nigerian probably will ask you, this platform, this open data, how does it put food on my table, you know, without even knowing that an, an increase in dollar or an increase in purchase of something, you know, affects your purchasing power. So it's for us to make sure that we bring all these things down to the grassroots and also make it very easy for them to understand this. So, so far, those are the challenges, you know, we are having. Um, well, negative impacts. Um, I remember one of the uh, projects in the community was making the uh, company registry more as accessible. Um, while the part of the company registry data was open data, um, the ownership registry was not. So this project scrapes everything and then put it into a searchable database, which is like a natural thing to do, right? Um, but guess what happened? Uh, a, a very unfortunate individual with a, a very unique name um, started a company and it was in, in, in the registry and uh, well sadly his employer found his name in the registry now because you can search by name now um, so he was fired because you're not supposed to start your business while working in some place um, so that was like um, a way that technology enables something the data was there you can search it because um, but you just cannot search by name before um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is that um, there are times that we think this is like, um, well, it's just unfortunate, but the impact that could be like unforeseen, and uh, um, I, I'm not sure if it, it's unavoidable um, if we're making this like this is already a, a legally required to be open data, uh, but just not accessible. But while in the process making that more accessible. Um, well, it's not even the mafia ownership story in from South Africa, right? Um, um, how in this process we uh, be more cautious and then um, minimize the impact for that? Um, yeah, we uh, um, 
that idea that like you've made something easier and now it's out there and enables something that you didn't expect. Um, we see a lot with uh, with Right to Know, our our version of um, Alivatelli, which is, helps people make freedom of information requests. Um, uh, we've we've been taking steps to try and reduce this, but people will come on and make a request to a local police agency, saying, "Hi, here's my name. Here's my children's names. We have a um, uh, um, an AVO out against um, against my partner. This is their name. Um, you know." And, and you know, then talk about their experience of child abuse. Um, like that's very, very private, important information that absolutely should not be online, should not be searchable online. And now it's on our platform, which we do everything possible to make it as searchable by Google as possible. And um, that really worries me a lot. Um, and we, so we monitor those, um, that feed and, uh, and you know, within the hour taking that stuff down and we've introduced design changes to try and um, reduce that. Um, on this I idea of kind of institutional backlash, um, uh, also on the FOI side, we've got a situation where, um, because there were so many freedom of information requests to uh, the Immigration Department of Australia, who are a very kind of politicized agency, um, they basically just, um, they changed the way their freedom of information department worked so that um, everything had to go through the minister's office, so it all has to be politically approved in order to release any information to people, um, which was incredibly dysfunctional and prevented people from getting information. Um, and the, the other um, thing I think is really interesting with planning alerts, that example, is um, the main, if, if you look at who has signed up to the most planning alerts, you see a lot of um, email addresses like uh, realestate.com and like Ray White's real estate and all that kind of stuff. So real estate agents love planning alerts. Um, real estate agents' mission is to sell houses more often and more expensively for people. Um, this is Sydney is one of the most expensive cities in the world, and you know Australia is a very expensive uh, country to live in. Um, wages are static over 30 years. House prices are up. Um, our, in our vision of democracy, it is. It's not just that people can go and vote or they can give feedback on a DA. If you're working 50 hours a week to pay a 50-year mortgage so that you can live in a tiny house you know, that is two hours away from your job in, in Sydney, um, how do you have time to engage with your democracy to try and, and make your area better? Um, that, that really, you know, that worries us. Um, it's really... It's, tri it's very difficult for us to do anything about that. I think that is a kind of standing negative impact of one of our projects. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to do about it, unfortunately. Thanks, Gemma. Yeah, so I was gonna mention um, release of public informa uh, personal information on um, public platforms, which is obviously a problem. And the stuff that you've been doing to sort of prevent personal information requests is really useful for the whole community of um, FYI platforms around the world. Um, I guess some negative impacts of my society tools have been, say, Fix My Street, um, you know, it's a whole thing, oh, it's community, everyone getting together and discussing a local problem, but actually it turns into arguments a lot. <laughs> There's a few long-standing running arguments on Fix My Street of people just getting more and more irate with each other, um, so that's <laughs> not a great impact. Um, also, and this is something we're going to discuss on a panel later, um, but some of our research has shown that Perhaps we're empowering the already empowered. Um, so some of the uh, stats on users uh, suggest that a lot of people are, say, on Fix My Street, a lot of them are uh, more educated, not necessarily educated, but more male and more white. Um, and, you know, in the UK, they're kind of more, they've got power anyway. Um, so one of, you know, obviously my society's goal is to give power to those people that, you know, need it. Um, so that's kind of a bit of a worrying trend, which, yeah, something we'll discuss on the panel later. Um, but, um, yeah, they're kind of the main negative things that I can think of from our, pa our tools. Yeah, in the case of the work of the lab, uh, we work in contexts wherein secrecy is the norm and power is subsided in favor of the government. So every time we have a new data set that is important for people to play on. It's something actually which is a big win already for us. Um, but that doesn't always happen all the time. So why? 
Because if you talk about health data set, they, can, they will disclose. Education, they will. Why? Because no one can argue with the fact that, you know, uh, everyone wants a child to be healthy and educated. But if you go towards very sensitive topics as contracts, uh, contracting agreements, uh, minutes of meetings, for example, of uh, how uh, the contractor was being selected for award, uh, then you see governments actually closing in. Uh, so we have a lot of experiences wherein we saw that despite efforts to actually promote transparency and openness in governance, we need to talk more about very sensitive topics that cut the core of uh, uh, inefficiencies and corrupt practices within government, then you can see that government actually closes in. And then they compensate that by flooding their portals with so many data sets that you don't actually need. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, in our work, that has happened quite a lot. Another negative impact that I would like to mention is that we, we experimented with the, with the, with the with the notion, with the hypothesis that you can actually use open data to bridge the trust between government and citizens. Well, the opposite occurred. So that, what actually happened is they distrusted each other more because of the fact that the, the, the data that was actually disclosed was of poor quality and civil society was actually thinking that government just made it up. Uh, so many issues that I recognize here and so many I want to dig more into, but we've only got about 10 minutes left before lunch. So um, does anyone here have any questions they would like to ask our lovely panel? Hi, thank you. My name is Goran. Um, I have a question because um, what I see most of the issues that you're having is the divide between um, we the people and they the government. Um, is any of you actually working on changing the democracy in your, in your countries, not to be a representative democracy, but to be a direct democracy? And because what we see basically throughout history is the more people decide directly, the better society is. And basically all the problems that, that you have described so far and negative impact and the issues that you're having, I, I think might be solved just by using direct democracy. So are you working towards this? Okay, structural issue there. Um, because of time, it'd be good if we could just take maybe two or three questions so that, and then we'll group them all together so the panel can answer them all. Um, I saw a hand at the back down there. Hi, uh, my question is uh, potentially for the My Society, WW Foundation, and uh, our colleague from Nigeria. Um, I'm interested to hear about what you think are the limits of open data tools, because there seems to be more discussions about, you know, the positive impacts while also noting about the, the negative impacts. But um, my, my question is particularly about what do you think are the practical uh, limits uh, to the use of open data relative to um, highly difficult policy choices? or when you're trying to influence a policy, but there is a very constrained civic space, or when the policy that is in question meets some resistance from politicians or companies that have their own vested interest, either on you know, specific policy on, on disclosure, uh, including on procurement, or in on the mining industry. And at one point, do you have to say, Okay, maybe we have to step. Uh, maybe we, we need to take a, uh, a step back and say that maybe there's a limit to what we can do, or maybe what we could say is that open data tools should be complemented by the traditional old style form of policy activism. So I think this is the question for. You. Thank you. Uh, do you have any Hi, Alvaro from Code for Australia. Um, more of like a bit of a personal question. Have you, what, have, has anything changed your mind based on your role? So is there anything that has changed your mind since you started your role? Cool, okay, three really interesting questions there. Um, Luke, should we start with you this time? Um, 
maybe this is combining the first two questions. Um, and yeah, Alvaro, um, yeah, I think so many things. <laughs> I, I, it's so hard to think of something. Um, you know, uh, the more I interact with people really trying to create change in their communities, um, I increasingly think, maybe this goes to the question at the back, um, that this world, this is about um, helping, you know, plugging in tools and skilling up maybe or building capacity or whatever you want to call it, um, but also bringing a, a new frame to traditional activism. Um, and I think, think that more and more. Um, but yeah, this question about the structural change, I think that's really key. In Australia, you know, if we think about open democracy in Australia improving, um, improving the situation for citizens there, things are, are very bad and are, you know, are, this is my perspective, but I think are getting much worse um, democratically in Australia. And, you know, despite these tools, you know, which, which are, you know, I really love, um, we're not making the difference that we need to be making. And I think that problem is, is structural. Um, with this planning uh, example, you know, the answer is not to skill up, or I don't think the answer is to skill up people in working with the current planning system. I think what we actually need to do now is hook into the structural with projects that are about, the project open bylaws um, that we were talking about last night, um, those projects that are about revealing the law to people, but then also providing them tools to try and change those laws and change the system, um, I think that's actually where those next steps need to be for us. Um, because you know the the planning system is just like blatantly unfair and and disadvantages people. So you know we can make it as easy to use as we like, but ultimately, you know it's it's a structural problem. Um, for for the structural problem, I think uh, well, I guess combining the first two is good, <laughs> and uh, um, I guess this is a hard problem that a lot of uh, the civic tech community are solving, and. Uh, um, uh, we 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 all have like um, well the fancy imagination about how we want to have direct democracy to, to today, um, but we in the community we try most of the tools that uh, way back it was there's pirate party doing this delegate uh, liquid democracy, and uh, um, there's new tool police trying to plot the um, the uh, the spectrum of opinions, um, but all these tools are not, are not scaling yet. So we're not solving the problem that uh, half a million people making a decision just yet. <clears throat> and there are not probably just uh, technology required to solve that. Um, the whole process of an information flow, including how we make open data more on demand when we want to, when we want these half million people to understand the issue better and how can we make it an interactive process and making information um, um, according to uh, how they want to approach this issue being discussed. And that is still quite a hard problem. And <laughs> um, I guess a lot of people are working to, to toward that. And uh, um, so um, in, in particularly in Taiwan, uh, the V Taiwan project is trying to combine some of the best practices in the uh, deliberation tech technology, um, which I think you will hear a bit more uh, in the, um, the government-led civic tech panel in this afternoon. Um, and the change in mind, um, I don't know. It can change a lot in five years. <laughs> and uh, I guess that's a, a better question for, for those who change, also change their position. I guess, for example, Audrey uh, started in the community and then now uh, she works in the government as the digital minister. So I guess that's also a good question for her. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I'm gonna start with um, the last question if um, anything has changed my mind, if I get that correctly. So, as a procurement monitor over the years, I've been monitoring and tracking public resources through responses that I get over time by writing freedom of information request, which takes sometimes seven days, one month, two months. I got to realize that even though I spend months waiting for uh, a public institution to give me responses or list of contracts that it awarded, I'm not even sure that those contracts, the information I'm going to get, will be useful for me. So over time, we've realized that we have to proactively disclose this information. And for me, that was what changed for me. I don't have to wait. 
the citizens don't have to wait. We don't ease our right. And the primary responsibility of the government is to ensure social welfare and, of course, the security of its citizens. So for us, we want this information to be proactively disclosed and also in a coherent manner that can enable me to make analysis for wherever I am, whichever state I am in Nigeria. And also outside Nigeria, I have the right as a citizen because I pay taxes. So we citizens, yes, it depends on what we want because, yes, just like you said, um, in a democratic uh, um, um, regime, power resides with the people. So it's left for the people to say that this is what we want. This are the type of information we want the government to disclose in a coherent manner and timely, in a way that can uh, um, facilitate public access to them, in a way that the citizens can actually make sense with that data because you can't keep giving me data that you know that I can't even use if it's if it's not in a coherent manner or in a way that I want it I may actually not make sense or make good use of that information so for us a lot of things change from just monitoring and requesting for information to advocacy for our government to have this proactively disclosed in a way that we the citizens want it so that's all I have to say Thank you. Uh, Michael, anything changed your mind? Any direct democracy uh, thing? Um, at, the open, uh, at the Open Data Lab in Jakarta, we seek first to understand before we intervene. And that practically means that you don't actually treat open data as a silver bullet and say, for example, that for all types of problems, that can be an answer. Um, there are some contexts, for example, in the areas you work in where open data cannot be used as a tool to advocate for greater transparency, and you have to use the usual route routes of freedom of information and street democracy or street protest, for example, to demand for information. So open data can also work, obviously, if there's the infrastructure and the platform for that, and there's internet connectivity, and a lot of the people are actually uh, uh, connected to the to the web, and in our case, in the context we work with, not are actually there's a high degree of digital divide and digital inequality. And yes, uh, we don't actually treat open data just as it is and the only tool that we have, because as as what a friend of our a colleague of mine, uh, Nena, uh, uh, said in one of the forum, open data is not an only child. You have statistics data. You have. Uh, you have like government data, you have private corporation data, and so on. Uh, being able to see uh, the ecosystem of data from a more nuanced perspective is important to be able to select the kind and type of approach that you would like to do and in, in a given context. What has changed in me? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> Uh, before my questions, uh, I'm actually I'm working in the open data field. I'm becoming more and more critical of the kinds of claims that we have. So, uh, because the kinds of work that we do, there's always, oftentimes, the, count, the counterfactual is absent. You cannot actually say, so my question now is, if this is happening in the project that we're doing, can this happen without open data? And I think uh, asking that kind of question yields a lot more uh, realizations, because oftentimes you say, yeah, that happens because open data is the one that made it happen. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, OK, so <laughs> just something that maybe changed my mind since starting my role. Um, just the importance, perhaps, of not separating um, ourselves into the people and government. Um, it's, you know, it's important to work together. And obviously, the way my society started, it was very much, we are the people and this is what we want from government, and this is how we're lowering the bar barriers to government, even though we had contacts in government. Um, but, I mean, a lot of our tools now, we're realising, will have more of an impact and more responsiveness if we work together with governments. And some of our tools, we are doing that more. Um, and there has been research to suggest that it does make more impactful tools, and it will be more useful, and government will help, you'll have the buy-in from the government, and impacts will increase. Um, so I guess that's something that definitely you change your mind as you work in projects that actually we should join forces a little bit more, especially at my society. Great. Well, uh, that's kind of all we've got time for. You'll be pleased to know it's lunchtime, um, my favourite session of the day. Um, so thank you very much to our lovely panel. Please uh, show your appreciation.